So to recap, for parametric curves, we have the independent variable t and three functions of t giving the x, y, and z coordinates of the points on the curve. Now take these three and form the vector having them as components. Now a function having the input t and that vector as output is called a vector valued function. So suppose f, g, and h are real valued functions of the parameter t. Then a function r whose value at t is the vector having components f of t, g of t, h of t is called a vector valued function or simply a vector function. It is called vector valued and the notation for vectors is adopted because its set of outputs or its range is a set of vectors. In this case, the function is said to be of one parameter because its input or its set of inputs or its domain is some set of real numbers. Here, f, g, and h are called the component functions of R. Now, recall the linear and helical examples earlier. And let's form the vector-valued functions, having the functions giving the x, y, and z coordinates as their components. So, for example, 1, we have the vector function r of t with components 1 plus, r, uh, 1 plus 3t, negative 2 plus 4t, and 3 minus t. And for the helical example, we have the vector function s of t with components cosine t, sine t, and t. Then the value of the function r, negative 5, is just the vector with components 1 plus 3 times negative 5, negative 2 plus 4 times negative 5, and 3 minus negative 5, or the vector with components negative 14, negative 22, and 8. Meanwhile, the value of the function s at 3 pi is just the vector with components cosine 3 pi, sine 3 pi, and 3 pi, or negative 1, 0, 3 pi. So, the input, again, is a real number, and the output is a vector. We have a new type of function, and it's now natural to ask what its domain is. Now, in order for r to be defined at t, then each of the components must be defined, meaning t should belong to the domains of f, g, and h. Thus, if no domain is specified, then we just take the domain of r to be the intersection of the domains of f, g, and h. For example, let's try to find the natural domains of the following vector function. Now, we can think of the k-hat component of the vector function v as the zero function. And the domain of the zero function is the set of all real numbers. So it's enough to consider the component functions f of t equals ln of t minus 1 and g of t equals 1 over t squared minus t minus 6. Recall that the natural logarithm is defined only on the set of positive real numbers. So t minus 1 should be positive or t should be in 1 to infinity. Now for the rational function z to be defined, then we just need to ensure that the denominator is non-zero. This factors as t minus 3 times t plus 2, so the domain of g is the set of real numbers except negative 2 and 3. Thus the domain of v is the intersection of these two sets. And we just need to remove now from the set 1 to infinity the numbers negative 2 and 3. But negative 2 is not in that set anyway. Therefore, we obtain the union of the intervals 1 to 3 and 3 to positive infinity. Now for the vector w, or the vector function rather w, we have the following component functions. The domain of f is the set of real numbers except negative 5. Now, for g to be defined, 4 minus t should be non-negative, so t should be less than or equal to 4. Thus, the domain of g is the interval from negative infinity to 4, including 4. 
Now, the function h is just the natural exponential function, so its domain is the set of real numbers. Now, the domain of w, again, is the intersection of these three sets. So we just have to remove from the set negative infinity to 4 the number negative 5, giving us the union negative infinity to negative 5, union negative 5 to 4, including 4. Next, we define the graph of a vector valued function. Note that the image of t under a vector valued function r is a vector. And as t varies, this vector also changes. Now consider the position representation of this vector. Recall the position representation is one with the initial point at the origin. Now we consider the terminal point of this vector. Now as t increases and the vector changes, the terminal point traces out a space curve. This space curve is what we define to be the graph of the vector function r. Now since the vector is in position representation, again its initial point 0, 0, 0. Now since the components of the vector are f of t, g of t, and h of t, then the coordinates of the terminal point are also given by f of t, g of t, and h of t. Thus, the curve traced out by the terminal points is also the parametric curve with parametric equations x equals f of t, y equals g of t, and z equals h of t. Hence, the graph of the vector valued function r with components f, g, and h is just precisely the same as the curve with parametric equations x equals f of t, y equals g of t, and z equals h of t. For instance, consider the vector function s with components cosine t, sine t, and t. Uh, recall that this is the vector function associated with the parametric equations of example 3. Substituting some special values of t, we obtain the following table. Now, as pointed out in the previous slide, the components of these vectors are precisely the coordinates of the terminal points of their position representations. And these points are also the same points obtained in example 3. Now, we draw these vectors in their position representations. This is the vector 1, 0, 0, square root of 3 over 2, 1 half pi over 6, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2 pi over 4, etc. Now, uh, again, the terminal points of these vectors are precisely the points obtained in example 3 earlier, so that the curve traced out is the same helix that we obtained earlier. This slide demonstrates how the vector s of t changes and how the curve is traced as t increases from 0 to 5 pi. Now, you might ask why distinguish between a vector-valued function and a set of parametric equations because they generate the same graph anyway. Well, we will think of these in terms of vector functions because the vector operations and the calculus of vector functions that we will be studying in the next few meetings or in the next few lectures, would somewhat uh, condense our calculations of quantities that we will use to describe geometric aspects of the space curves defined by these vector-valued functions, and to describe the motion of a particle in space. So again, this is the graph of the function S. It's the same as the graph we obtained in example 3. Similarly, the graph of the vector function r in example 4 is the same as the curve given by the parametric equations of example 1. Now we make the following remark. It follows from the previous lecture on equations of lines and planes that a vector function for the line passing through the point with coordinate x sub 0, y sub 0, z sub 0 and direction vector ABC is the following. 
R of t equals the vector with components x sub 0 plus a t, y sub 0 plus b t, and z sub 0 plus c t. This is just because a set of parametric equations for the line satisfying these properties consists of x equals x sub 0 plus a t, y equals y 0 plus b t, and z equals z 0 plus c t. Now, let's just decompose this vector into a sum to understand better why this is true. Now, this vector can be written as the sum of the vector x0, y0, z0, and the product of a, b, c with the scalar t. We interpret this as follows. The line passing through this point and having this direction vector is obtained by taking this point, x0, y0, z0, and adding to it all scalar multiples of the vector a, b, c. So you have a point and add to it all scalar multiples of the vector a, b, c to form the line satisfying these properties. Now, suppose we're asked to find a vector function for the line segment from this point with coordinate 1, 0, negative 2 to the point with coordinate one, uh, negative 1, 2, 1. Since this is a line segment, we can use this remark to obtain first a vector function for the line containing this line segment. For the direction vector, since we are orienting the line segment from P to Q, we use the vector PQ. And this is obtained by subtracting the coordinates of P from those of Q. So we have minus, uh, negative 1 minus 1, 2 minus 0, and 1 minus negative 2, or negative 2, 2, 3. Therefore, using this remark and using the point P as a reference point, then a vector function for this line is r of t equals 1 minus 2t, 0 plus 2t, negative 2 plus 3t. Now we just need to identify the values of t corresponding to the points p and q. Equating 1 minus 2t, 2t, and negative 2 plus 3t to 1, 0, and negative 2 respectively, we obtain 2t equals 0 or t equals 0. Similarly, equating these three to negative 1, 2, and 1 respectively, we have 2t equals 2 or t equals 1. Therefore, a vector function for the segment directed from p to q is r of t equals 1 minus 2t, 2t, negative 2 plus 3t, where t runs from 0 to 1. 